Welcome, I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Medical officials in the Democratic Republic of Congo are facing uh, a challenge to contain a deadly outbreak of Ebola. Two Ebola patients who slipped out of a hospital quarantine later attended a prayer meeting, potentially putting the 50 to 60 attendees at risk of contracting the disease. Dr. Jacques Lemon uh, Cabral, emergency medical coordinator for Doctors Without Borders, says both patients were vomiting and infectious and died hours after the prayer session in the port city of Mbandaka. Aid agencies are now uh, tasked with the challenge of tracking down everyone they came in contact with and vaccinating them. That complicates efforts to contain the outbreak that has killed at least 27 people. The escapees underscore, the escapes rather underscore the painful process of putting people in isolation, separating them from their support networks. Ebola spreads through contact with infected bodily fluids. Uh, the rare disease causes fever, vomiting and diarrhea. Let's listen to the DRC's Minister of Health. From the beginning, we knew that it was a, an outbreak with highly potential danger because it started in two health zones, not far from uh, the city of Bandaka. So the potential to have an urban outbreak was very high from the beginning. So we took all the measures to contain the outbreak and to have a very quick response. For us, we know also that the incubation period is 21 days. It means that all the people we are tracing today who were in contact with the Ebola cases are at risk to develop the disease in the coming days. So for us, it's not unexpected. So we expect in the coming days to increase of cases among the contacts. Well, and now moving on to West Africa. Amnesty International is accusing the Nigerian military of committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. In its Kithun report, the human rights group says the crimes, which include the rape, torture and killing of civilians, were perpetrated for years during the military's fight against the Boko Haram terrorist group. Amnesty says the abuses continued despite a presidential inquiry established last August. The findings of that inquiry have not yet been released. In a statement, uh, the Nigerian military described the findings as a false report on fictitious rape incidents. A Nigerian president's statement says the 89-page report lacks credibility. But Amnesty says the findings are based on hundreds of interviews and accounts of how women and children died after being tortured and beaten by the military and detained without food and water. Africa Day is the annual commemoration of the creation of the Organization of African Unity, now known as the African Union, May 25, 1963. The day is celebrated in various countries across the continent as well as around the world. To tell us more about some of the activities that mark this day, Mohamed Lamine Sadi Khan, coordinator, Africans Rising Movement, joins me live via Skype from Dakar, Senegal. Uh, Mohamed, good evening. Good evening. Yes, now, this is a, a really important day for many across Africa. Say, tell me, uh, what does Africa Rising, or what does this mean uh, particularly to Africans Rising uh, movement? Yeah, Africans Rising um, for Justice, Peace and Dignity is a grassroots Pan-African movement of the people of Africa and as well those in diaspora. So um, the, the Africa Day is um, a critical moment for, for, for the Africans Rising movement as it is the bad day of, of, of this uh, Pan-African movement that is um, bringing all the different civil society um, uh, coalition or formations and then different sectors of civil society to you know deliver um, help deliver um, what is called um, uh, justice peace and dignity for for the African continent um, mm -hmm. we believe that with unity of uh, within Africa we can we can achieve a lot um, we can we can build the Africa we want and we can achieve the Africa we need you know this sounds like a yeah, real normal like a idea and especially after uh, you you outlined your vision uh, at the Kilimanjaro Declaration, but really practically, how do you do this? What are the specific activities and how are they coordinated? Yeah, for, for our day, um, it's one of the um, key uh, mobilization moments that we have agreed um, as a movement that uh, we want to reflect on uh, the, the aspirations of these um, founding fathers. We want to reflect on the aspirations of, of the 
the generation now to see how do we work together as, as a continent to achieve um, um, a river right um, Africa that we are all yearning for. So there are events and then mobilization happen across the continent in more than 45 countries on the continent um, and then um, tens so tens of thousands of events have been organized across um, Africa, but as well in diaspora, where Africans are reflecting, where Africans are, you know, uh, engaging in dialogue, trying to, you know, engage the leaders, but also engage the grassroots communities to really bring down um, uh, the real thinking around how do we create that unity, that uh, connection of different struggles to, uh, to deliver the, uh, the Africa we want. You know, many times you get the sense that uh, many Africans, especially youth and also people in the civil society, uh, tend to have a great vision for the continent, for the future of Africa as far as unity is concerned. But there's a kind of a disconnect with those in power, with government. So what efforts are there on the ground from your organization to kind of bring in especially political leadership? Yeah, um, the formation of the movement actually um, came along with um, uh, the parliamentarians. It also came along with different sectors of civil society, those in trade unions, those in uh, faith-based organizations, those in traditional NGOs, those in grassroots movements that are not even uh, registered in some way, all came together to really um, say, what can we do in terms of really delivering um, the needs of Africans, especially in the civil society sector? Um, there is always a challenge that our leaders are not really um, you know, implementing uh, what they always put on policies. So this movement is out there to hold leaders accountable to ensure that you know, leaders are, um, um, are living up to the expectations that they have put in, uh, in place when they are, when they are put uh, into power. So uh, um, we also promise in what we call in the family charter, called the Kilimanjaro Declaration, that we need to be there when uh, people are in crisis. So that's why we are very much um, pragmatic in terms of responding to the uh, different crises that are happening in the continent. And then as we are talking now, we are working with different countries that are in crisis in terms of uh, human rights violations on the people that are up there to speak their minds and then hold governments accountable. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, you talk about uh, uh, people's right to peace, uh, social uh, inclusion, uh, shared prosperity, uh, but we know that uh, many times the government uh, kind of, uh, some of the governments are uh, kind of uh, not accommodating of uh, critical views and they would see people like you or uh, such uh, civil society organizations that, as enemies of the state. How frustrating is this to you and uh, how do you go about it? Yeah, I think this is a challenge. It's a bigger challenge. I have tested to be arrested, I think, some couple of times. I was arrested in Gambia when we were fighting uh, the uh, tyrant dictator Jame uh, during that time of the political impasse and before uh, the political impasse. And then uh, last year, I was also arrested in, in Togo, you know, when they, we went there for a uh, soldier mission. Africans rising have been responding to different crises. So we went there um, in Togo to um, you know, be in solidarity with uh, people, our brothers and sisters who are in the front line of, of, uh, of you know, asking for, for their rights and asking for time limit in Togo. Um, and we'll be speaking to the government, speaking to the opposition, but at the end of the day, we have to be arrested and then our gadgets have been confiscated for five days or more. And then this is a life threatening for us as activists and then a life threatening for the activists that we work with. But we, will, we, we, we promise ourselves that we will not rely and we will continue to work and then deliver uh, that Africa unity uh, within the civil society sector, within the citizens, so, and so that we are able to hold governments accountable to, to deliver um, the aspirations of everyone in Africa, that creating that unity, uh, that, that belief in itself, that uh, Africa is a blessed continent. You know, there's a friend of mine called Nyakalago K. He fronts this uh, organization called uh, uh, Pan-Africanism. <clears throat> uh, uh, and, and, I, and I tend to, to joke with him. I say he's probably the only Pan-Africanist on the continent. So are your aspirations uh, such kind of different than the concept of uh, creating a Pan-Africanist kind of continent? Yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the dream that we, are, that, we are, that we are working towards, you know. We believe that civil society felt that they have not been very responsive. They have not been, um, you know, working on the needs of um, African people when they're in crisis. Sometimes they run away or they hide themselves on the corners. So, uh, you know, we, we believe that Africa need to unite. Africa, African people need to believe in themselves in that spirit of Pan-Africanism to deliver the the, the, the the aspirations and the needs of African people. So. We are all on the same agenda, and then the, the movement is very much open to all the uh, initiatives that have been there in terms of strengthening the Pan-Africanism in the continent. So we are working with all the different sectors to ensure that um, uh, we kind of create that unity in Africa, uh, be able to you know, create that bigger voice and that bigger power to be able to challenge different um, 
um, um, atrocities that are happening on, on, the, on the different continents, on, especially on human rights violations, that our governments and then uh, um, uh, other human rights violations, um, co uh, multinational companies are, are putting, are putting on, on, on the people of Africa. But how can you reassure people, especially when they look at a country, say, like South Sudan, and say, look, uh, this is a country that people look forward to seeing as a model of a new baby of a country in Africa, and then suddenly you see it breaking up into this terrible chaos, people dying. I mean, how do you tell people that all continent can unite when just one single country doesn't seem to be getting it together? Yeah, I, I think that's the whole challenge around, you know, um, the conscientization and building the consciousness of the people, the citizens, to understand that, you know, um, uh, we need to we need to unite, we need to, you know, uh, dialogue and then have solutions within within the continent. Um, the solutions of our problems cannot come from outside; it has to come from us. We we need to be able to uh, take charge of our destiny and then um, work together as as brothers and sisters to deliver uh, that peace and then and, uh, that shared. Um, uh, prosperity that we that we are that we are yearning for. So um, the people of um, uh, South Sudan need to realize that you know it's high time for us to you know for, for them to unite and then and then uh, deliver the promise of of their independence. Of all of your programs and activities, can you mention one or two uh, that you have uh, successfully managed to accomplish up to this moment uh, as a kind of uh, uh, an example of what Africans Rising has done so far? Yeah, um, as I said, uh, the movement is uh, very pretty new. Uh, we launched it last year. It was initiated in 2016. Um, from then, the movement has been very much proactive in terms of implementing the, uh, the commitments in the Kilimanjaro Declaration, that is the founding charter. So one of the key commitments in terms of the founding charter is, you know, we need to be responsive to, um, to Africans when they're in crisis. We should not wait for um, support to come from out of the continent, but we need, within the continent, we need to respond. So there have been solidarity missions. That solidarity missions are fact-finding missions and where we support activists and their movement, but also dialogue with government and opposition to try to find a solution in the crisis that they're facing. So that was one that was held in Gambia when the political uh, crisis was there, when Gambia was refused to move after the elections. And then um, they, they were in, the team was in Cameroon as well uh, sometime last year. Uh, when uh, the internet was shut down, and then we're still working with the team in Cameroon to ensure that you know uh, peace and tranquility exists in that particular uh, particular country. There's a lot of human rights violations. Um, um, villages have been burned down, compounds have been burned down, people have been killed on a daily basis in that in that in that particular country. And we are also working with um, uh, the uh, people of Togo. As I said earlier, we are there. We were there in, the, in a solidarity mission, and then um, trying to work with all the different uh, sectors of society to ensure that um, the people right and people wishes are as well respected. Okay. Um, the activism residents uh, which is bringing activists together from across the continent try to come and see uh, refresh and then as well uh, learn from um, different innovation and tactics okay. in terms of how they can address the agenda was also um, one you. of the key things that we, we implement. Yeah. Great uh, Mr. Saidi Khan with thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, with Thank you. Uh, that is uh, Mohamed Lamin Sadi Khan, who is the coordinator of the Africans Rising movement. He joined us live from Dakar, Senegal. U.S. Vice Pre uh, US President Donald Trump is vowing to make radical changes to U.S. aid practices by withholding government assistance from countries who allow criminals to sneak into the United States. Trump spoke Wednesday at a forum in New York, the U.S. state that is battling gang activity. New York officials briefed uh, Trump on the progress they have made toward dismantling the violent MS-13 gang. Viewers, Latitza Hoke has more. MS-13 was started in the 1980s in Los Angeles by immigrants from El Salvador. It has since expanded to include Hondurans, Guatemalans, Mexicans, and others from Central and South American countries. The gang's motto is kill, rape, and control. I called them animals the other day, and I was met with rebuke. They said, they're people. They're not people. These are animals. Trump has made dismantling MS-13 one of his top priorities. He praised the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency for jailing and deporting thousands of gang members. A senior agency official said 4,800 gang members, including 
Hundreds of MS-13 leaders and associates were arrested last year across the United States. We want to push our borders out, so we're attacking MS-13 where, they, where the command controls in El Salvador. Our attache, attache offices in Central America are working very closely with the federal police in El Salvador, along with El Salvadoran prosecutors. We have arrested and taken off the streets in El Salvador hundreds of MS-13 gang members. Trump said countries that allow their criminals to slip into the United States will be penalized. We're going to work out something where every time somebody comes in from a certain country, we're going to deduct a rather large amount of money from what we give them in aid, if we give them aid at all, which we may not just give them aid at all, because despite all of the reports I hear, I don't believe they're helping us one bit. Critics say Trump is using fear of gangs to advance his anti-immigrant agenda. The president will use whatever excuse is possible to advance his anti-immigrant agenda, to advance his xenophobia, to advance his racism. And that is why we are raising our voice so that he knows he is not well received in this community. Local advocacy groups and families gathered outside the forum venue on Wednesday to protest recent raids on undocumented immigrants in New York, as did Trump's supporters. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. On the heels of an insult of U.S. Vice President Mike Pence earlier Thursday in a statement by North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister, calling Pence a political dummy and warned in rhetoric typical of that uttered by Pyongyang of a nuclear confrontation, President Trump has cancelled his planned June 12 summit in Singapore with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The president said in a letter to Kim released Thursday in the court, I was very much looking forward to being there with you, sadly, based on the tremendous anger and open hostility displayed in your most recent statement. I feel it is inappropriate at this time to have this long planned meeting. Well, you're watching Africa 54 in a moment. Ebola on the agenda of the World Health Assembly in Geneva. But first, here's a recap of Thursday's headlines. Human rights group Amnesty International says Nigeria's military has committed war crimes and crimes against humanity during its fight against Islamic insurgency Boko Haram. In Burkina Faso, the country's prosecutor says four alleged jihadists, three of whom were killed Tuesday in a pre-dawn raid, had a link to the March 2nd attacks targeting the military headquarters and French embassy in Ouagadougou. In Burundi, the president of the National Communication Council says the board is waiting for delegations from the BBC and VOA before lifting the broadcast ban against them in the country. The Togolese government begins paying financial compensation 13 years after the 2005 post-election violence led by security forces that killed between four and 500 people. Well, it's time for our health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu with news from the World Health Assembly. Lino. The 71st session of the World Health Organization's World Health Assembly is ongoing in Geneva, Switzerland. The World Health Assembly is the decision-making body of the WHO. Its main functions are to determine the policies of the organization, supervise financial policies, and review and approve the proposed program budget. The meeting kicked off Monday with discussions on the Ebola outbreak in DRC. In addition, participants also discussed the need to support universal health coverage. The Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, and President Paul Kagame of Rwanda spoke on the subject. Many of the other countries I have visited, including China, Cuba, Denmark, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, are living proof that universal health coverage is not a pipe dream. It's a reality for countries all over the world at all income levels. Our experience in Rwanda is that an early emphasis on primary health care was one of the most effective strategies for rebuilding trust between citizens and the government in the aftermath of a national tragedy. 
and this year's conference has attracted nearly 4,000 delegates from WHO's 194 members and partners organizations and will conclude on May 26. Now, in Thailand, the giant African snail, once condemned as a slimy pest that ruins crops, is now being bred for the same reason some people found them so unappealing in the first place, their slime. Experts say the slime produced by these giant snails is full of collagen and other ingre ingredients that can regenerate skin cells for use in the cosmetics industry. VOA's Maria Matialo tells us more. By nurturing these snails in this kind of environment, snail farmers say they also get something in return. If we keep them happy by providing them with a pleasant habitat and good food, they'll be healthy. The mucus they produce will also benefit us by generating more profits. The Thai farmer tends to about 3,000 medium to large sized snails, which he says can bring him nearly $950 a month. Keeping these snails happy also has other advantages, says this snail expert. They'll eat a lot, just as they do in the wild, and produce a large amount of mucus. Keeping them in a natural and organic habitat also prevents animal cruelty. Traditionally, snail farmers agitate their snails to force them to produce their valuable slime. But in this farm, they use water to stimulate the animal to produce the gel-like secretion which in turn is sold to Aden International, a food and skincare company based in Thailand. We turn part of the freshly extracted snail mucus into a face serum product. The rest of the product is processed into powder and sold to other cosmetic companies. Snails use mucus to protect their bodies against cuts and bacteria. The substance contains elastin, proteins, glycolic acid, and an antimicrobial that said to work wonders on one's skin. We export the mucus powder to Korea and the United States as a cosmetics ingredient. There are about 85 snail breeding houses in this Thai province of Nakhon Nayak, about a two-hour drive from Bangkok. To keep them healthy, it's reported these snails typically get a four-month break, so they feel happy and well-rested after having their treasured assets extracted. Maria Magyalu, VOA News. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Vincent, back to you. Well, and thank you very much for joining us today, Lino. Be sure to watch for Lino Moudou every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa right here on Africa 54. Well, oceanographers often say we know much more about the surface of the Moon and Mars than we do about nearly 70% of our own planet. That's because most of the Earth is covered in water, most of it deeper than 200 meters. There are several initiatives to map the ocean's floors, and the latest comes from Japan. Viewers George Putich reports. It is understandable why we do not know much about the ocean's floor. It is expensive and dangerous to go deep down. But mapping it will render much useful data, from navigation and fishing to mineral deposits and even the movements of tsunami waves. For too long now, we have treated our own oceans as a forgotten frontier. It's time to change that because our oceans have an incredible amount of wealth and resources, and they truly, truly are uh, a very fruitful frontier. Using information collected by scientific and commercial vessels, as well as manned and unmanned scientific submarines, the project named Seabed 2030 will create a detailed map of 190 million square kilometers of ocean floor deeper than 200 meters. The project is led by Japan's philanthropic Nippon Foundation and the non-profit association General Bathymetric Chart of the Oceans, or JEBCO. It is also supported by the United Nations. The United Nations has adopted a resolution to have a decade of ocean science for sustainable development, running from 2021 to 2030. And during that decade, I'm very confident that we will have totally mapped the... Surf, uh, the, uh, the floor of the ocean. 
Parallel with this initiative, the non-profit foundation XPRIZE challenged researchers and inventors throughout the world to develop better and cheaper technologies for mapping the ocean floor. One of the reasons that we don't yet have a good map of the seafloor is it's a very expensive proposition. Um, so, and a big portion of that are the ships and going to sea. So we've really pushed, um, and all teams are now going to and are deploying from the coastline. Another benefit from this project will be the knowledge gained about the final resting place of many sunken ships, including the possible location of the Malaysia Airlines jet, which disappeared in 2014 while flying above the Indian Ocean. George Putic, VOA News. Well, a new study by Johns Hopkins University says urban foraging, the act of finding naturally growing edible food in urban settings in the U.S. is on the rise. But before setting out with basket and blade, experts recommend would be uh, foragers to take classes to determine what's edible and what might make you sick. Fortunately, foraging classes are popping up across the country. Is viewers Faith Lapidus. Several times a month, ethnobotanist Hayden Steppens takes a group of students out on foraging walks to teach them about feel-to-table foods. He starts with the basics. So Asteraceae is our sunflower family, and the, this plant family has what are called compound flowers. Most people, when they're walking through the world, plants just form this green background that uh, doesn't really undifferentiate it. It's just this green wall. But once you start to learn about one plant or two plants, it becomes almost a mosaic and becomes more beautiful. And then the more you get into it, the more you can connect to your surroundings. Stebbins foraging classes are often sold out weeks in advance. It's a great treasure hunt. I mean, it's, it's like the more that you um, do it, the more that you see. I think I'm most excited about um, the wild mint, or they were calling it um, ground cover ivy, because I didn't know that that was an edible, and it's taken over my entire herb garden. Scavenging for food in the wild is nothing new. And Stepan says foraging has many benefits. Not only is it free, it reconnects people with nature, and it's local, so there are no environmental costs associated with transporting the food. It also helps curb invasive species, like garlic mustard. So here you have a plant that is very edible, disrupting a lot of our native ecosystems, but it's also incredibly nutritious. So you know, even though we have really bad food access in this country, there's a big disparity between people who can afford food and can't afford food. You have this ecological issue that could be reframed as a nutrition issue, and more people, I think, should have access to that. Just like dandelions, every part of the garlic mustard is edible. Its roots taste like horseradish, and its leaves have a taste similar to garlic and mustard. The plant is high in fiber, beta carotene, vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin E. But not all wild delicacies are safe to eat. Classes like Stebbins help foragers learn the difference between delicious and dangerous. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC and in the morning, still in Break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us in Washington. Have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. Woodwork is any part of a house or building that is made of wood. Crawl out of the woodwork. This expression sounds troubling. I won! I have the winning lottery ticket. <laughs> oh, that's great. How much money did you win? I won $25,000. But please, don't tell anyone. You're right.